1963, Bob Boothby was freer than ever to enjoy life. He'd been made a peer by Harold Macmillan, the husband of his lover. He was rector of St Andrews University, a star of television, judge at beauty contests, a national celebrity and doyen of society, both high and low. In February 1963, Boothby's lover, the cat burglar, Leslie Holt, introduced him to his good friend, Ronnie Cray. Cray was seeking investors for a business deal in Africa. Boothby had turned down the idea, but they got on well. Cray hired a photographer to record the occasion, and after the meeting, sent Boothby a small gift. Boothby wrote, Dear Mr Cray, I cannot thank you enough for the lovely piece of China. Over the next three years, their friendship blossomed, although sometimes it could produce a little social awkwardness. Once Ronnie Cray called round at Boothby's flat in Eaton Square. The door was answered by a young woman. She opened the door, um, the front door, and there was this sinister-looking man, quite unlike Bob's normal friends, who said, oh, I'm just passing it, it's Bob in. This was Ronnie Cray. And she was really rather frightened, and thought, who is this man? It seemed to her rather like a sort of gangster, and shut the door rather rudely in his face. Well, rather charmingly, later that day, there arrived sort of dozens and dozens of red roses as a way of apologising for frightening the girl. But it was quite obvious on this occasion that, I mean, you know, he was in the habit of just calling right and really knew Bob very well. With his famous friends, Ronnie Cray was at pains to behave like the perfect gentleman. But since the introduction had been made by his criminal lover, Boothby must have known there was another side to the Crays. Like Leslie Holt, the Cray twins at first made their names as teenage boxers. Reggie was skillful. Ronnie was the brawler. They may have loved their mum, but by their early twenties, their career was crime. They dominated the East End, their manor, as they like to call it, specialising in extortion by violence. In the late 50s, Ronnie Cray served a three-year prison term for grievous bodily harm. By the time Cray was introduced to Boothby, the twins had moved into the West End too and were London's top gangsters, running protection rackets and muscling in on a string of clubs. Any of those places they run had this air of menace, this feeling that violence could erupt at any moment. And violence on a very ruthless scale. I mean, they, they quite like the, the, you know, the cut and thrust of close combat. They just loved the, that stabbing and smashing and punching and kicking. That was their go. Ronnie Correa was, of course, the sort of dominant twin. Um, and he was also mad. Ronnie was definitely crazy, you know. He was subject to mood, quick turns of mood. Now, one, one night, there was a guy uh, in the Kentucky said to him, Ron, I think you better go to the country because you're getting a bit, putting on a bit of weight. So he said, yeah, come, I want to talk to you. Go in the toilet. And he cut him so badly, give him 70 sticks, six stitches. Like. We called the guy tram lines after that, you know. And it was just for that, for saying that. You know. But had he been in a good mood, he would have said, yeah, you're probably right, and laughed it off. In addition to his bouts of madness and violence, Ronnie Cray was a self-proclaimed homosexual, something of a novelty on the macho London crime scene. He never tried to hide that, you know, he was brave in puff, simply that. And, uh, get guys bringing boys into him, prospects they call them, bring them into him, either to curry favour or to sort of ease the way in the door. But he'd phone him first and say, I've got a lovely boy for you. They weren't homosexuals. They were heterosexual boys, but younger, maybe in their sort of late teens. The classic uh, modus operandi for seduction would be to take a, a young lad with a sort of got to know, up to the West End to a gambling club where he would lay the bets for them and obviously be highly flattered and all the attention they were getting using the sort of company of a star. Uh, and then late at night when 
they'd say, let's go to a hotel, and they'd go to one of these hotels, really quite local, and, um, and there would only be a double bed. That would be the classic scenario. These were young guys, young fighters, a lot of them. I couldn't, make, I couldn't believe it, you know, the way they, these young guys used to just go with him. Ronnie Cray's fondness for young men gave him something to share with his new friend, Lord Boothby. John Pearson, then a young journalist, gained a unique insight into the Crays after he was invited by them in their 60s heyday to write their biography. As soon as I started talking to any of the people round the Crays, they'd all say the same. They'd say, of course, you see, Bob Boothby, he was a friend of Ronnie's. Ronnie used to get him boys. He was always down at East End. We used to call Bob the Queen Mother. At their first meeting, Ronnie Cray had told Boothby he owned a gaming club called Esmeralda's Barn. For Boothby, it was just the ticket. He wrote to Cray, I shall be looking in at Esmeralda's, which is just round the corner from here. At Esmeralda's, Cray introduced Boothby to an attractive 17-year-old young man, the brother of one of Cray's own boyfriends. Boothby took to this boy, who for a time actually lived in Boothby's flat, and finally, being a criminal, forged a cheque of Boothby's for 1,800 quid and took it into the nearest branch of Barclays Bank, where he was promptly caught. Well, now, this was a potentially extremely dangerous thing for Boothby, obviously. You know, good-looking young boy stealing a cheque. What was he doing in Lord Boothby's flat? How was he able to know where the money came from? How was he able to forge his signature? All these questions would come up in court. But Boothby was protected from publicity. On Cray's instructions, the boy pleaded guilty at trial, said nothing, and went to prison. While he was in prison, Boothby, on three occasions, tried to get in to see this boy. On three occasions, Ronnie Cray stopped him going in, saying, don't be a silly old fool. Boothby was playing a risky double game. In June 1964, the star of television received television's most popular accolade. His respectable friends flocked to acclaim him. Ronnie Cray was not invited onto the programme, nor for that matter were Leslie Holt or Lady Dorothy McMillan. At the very time he was being fated on This Is Your Life, Boothby's friendship with Cray was attracting the attention of Scotland Yard's intelligence section, C11. They believed that the Boothby-Cray relationship itself was homosexual, still a criminal offence. But without the evidence to press any charges, leaked the story to the Sunday Mirror's crime correspondent, Norman Lucas. I was told that there was no doubt that this relationship existed, but they had no means of proving it. The Mirror's editor, Reg Payne, decided, after taking legal advice, to run the story, but not name Boothby or Cray. He phoned the Mirror's chairman, Cecil King, with news of the exciting scoop. Reg came back absolutely beaming. He said, old Cecil's got a dinner party on. He said, he's delighted. He said, this is going to give him a bomb to drop upon his dinner guests. King was very ambitious to get on the right side of Harold Wilson. This was in 1964, shortly before Wilson was going to win the election. And I think he saw this as a wonderful opportunity, something he could actually give the Labour Party. Another Profumo scandal, another, you know, a really big case on a big celebrity, which would do the Tory party damage at the election. 